My name is Peter and I'm a software engineer at Roblox and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we use Redis PubSub to keep our millions of users up to date. So first off, uh, who is Roblox? So Roblox is the world's largest social platform for play. Every month, over 48 million players log in, make friends, customize their avatars, and imagine, build, and play together within immersive 3D worlds. Everything in Roblox is user generated. It's created with tools that we provide our users to build, model, script within a fully featured physics engine, which we provide to them right out of the box. Our growing community of 1.7 million creators, most aged between 13 and 20, produce millions of 3D multiplayer experiences and games. Apart from the standard sort of genres of games that you'd see on other platforms, such as you know, platformers, shooters, adventure games, that kind of thing. There's a range of unique experiences which reflects the age of our creators. One of the most popular games of all time is Work at a Pizza Place, where the object of the game is to work at a pizza place, take orders, deliver pizzas. Another popular one is Roblox High School, where you have to go to school, show up for class on time, presumably do homework. I've never got that far. But that's the reason that we call Roblox the imagination platform. When you make a creation and click Publish, it's instantly available to play by all our users on Android, iPhones, iPads, PCs, Macs, Xbox One, with support for both VR on Oculus Rift and Vive. This makes it easy for our users to play together, regardless of what devices they have or where they are. And for creators, it's an incredibly accessible way to create a game and instantly make it available to millions of players worldwide. We take care of hosting and scaling the game. Whether there's 100 players or 100,000, we take care of that all at, charge, all at free of charge. So just to give an idea of the scale that we're dealing with at Roblox, at the moment we have 48 million monthly active users. And at peak times, we hit 1.1 million active players. We're delivering 420 million monthly engagement hours 5.9 billion monthly page views, and we've been growing at over 200% year over year in terms of active users for the past couple of years. So we're building a lot of great features and having to deal with some interesting scale problems as we go. We're big fans of Redis at Roblox, uh, and we use it in a number of places. Um, we use it like a lot of people as a general purpose LIU cache. Uh, for a lot of new product features, uh, Redis is one of the the first options we consider when we're thinking about how we're going to store the data, particularly while we're at a prototyping phase. Um, we use it extensively for rate limiting. I call it out just because with a large social platform where we take a bunch of really creative, smart kids and encourage them to make the most of our system, uh, sometimes they make the most of it in ways that aren't really good from our perspective, maybe abusing endpoints, that kind of stuff. So we want to be able to rate limit, and we use Redis for that a lot. And we use Redis as a message relay. And that's going to be the main focus of what I'm talking about today, how we use Redis PubSub to deliver messages from one part of the system to another. In terms of what we use, uh, we use both open source Redis and Redis Labs Enterprise Cluster. Uh, we're big fans of Redis Labs uh, when we want additional clustering features such as replication, uh, rebalancing. Uh, there's a lot of great features there that we like. And uh, we're on our backend servers are on a .NET on the .NET framework, so we use the Stack Exchange Redis client, uh, which uh, we're big fans of. So a little while back, um, at Roblox, we decided we needed to build a new chat system for our out-of-game experience for users. Uh, the old one wasn't really performing as we wanted. We knew it had a lot of problems. It wasn't a great user experience. Messages sort of got lost along the way. Um, and for a social network designed for play, chat is a really crucial part of that. Um, it's not just about talking with friends, it's about facilitating, coordinating activity. If I want to play games with my friends, it's really important that I can talk with them and quickly decide on what we want to play, how we want to play it. Chat at Roblox is also tied in with our presence system. It's one of the easiest ways to see which of your friends are online, if they're playing a game, and if so, what game are they playing. So it's really important that um, when we're thinking about the new chat system, obviously it needs to be scalable, but it needed to be really quick to update. If someone sends a message, we want you to see it straight away. 
If someone joins a game, we want to show that they're in that game. If someone leaves the game, we want you to know that they're no longer there. So when we were thinking about this, what we realized was we really need a real-time message delivery system. Chat was the main driver for its implementation, but we could instantly see that this is going to have a lot of benefits outside of chat itself. Um, it's really important, we find, to provide our users with an interactive experience. Um, for those of you who are in the um, keynote this morning, as, as Joshua McKenty said, um, kids these days, they grew up without VCRs. They never had to wait for a tape to rewind. They expect things to be instant. And uh, you know, with a product geared towards kids, we really want to give them the interactive experience that, that they want. Um, and crucially also, we wanted it to be able to be supported across the whole range of platforms that we offer Roblox on. So to do this, we thought about, okay, first off, from our edge servers to the client themselves, how are we gonna connect with that? We didn't want to use polling like our previous chat system. Um, maybe we could get away with polling if it was just chat, but as we said, we want to expand this tool and use it well beyond chat to update many parts of the system. We don't want to have hundreds of services all being polled constantly. WebSockets seem like an obvious solution to this. They're designed to have long-lasting, uh, long persistent connections and allow for easy sending of messages from a server to a client. Um, but when we were thinking about this a couple of years ago, we were a little worried about um, providing support for users on older browsers. We try and make Roblox available for people on a wide range of devices, and at that time, we were still supporting some browsers with somewhat patchy WebSocket support. So we ended up settling on a library called SignalR. Now, this is an open source library that uh, Microsoft put together, and uh, it's an open source both protocol and implementation of that for two-way server-client web communication. And what it does is it provides an abstraction over the top of the actual communication channel used. So if you're on a client that supports WebSockets, you know, a modern browser, then it'll use WebSockets. But if that's not available, it can fall back to other transports such as service end events, long polling. So we thought this was a nice compromise that would give us most of the benefits of WebSockets while still managing to have a broad support base for the other clients that we had out there. Also crucial for us, um, ASP.NET server support for the SignalR server, and there are good clients out there for JavaScript and .NET, and we were able to also find one for C++, which is great. The game client we build is written in C++, so we already had C++ libraries bundled across our clients on each platform. By using a C++ SignalR client, we were able to achieve our goal of having the system available on all of our clients. We then said, all right, how do we want to get our messages from all of our different microservices, anywhere in the system which might generate some event that's interesting? How do we want to get that out to the clients? Um, now, SignalR itself has a range of pluggable backplane options, but they didn't really match our usage pattern. Um, they're more concerned with if you had different clients getting messages between them, but we really wanted to go from our server to clients. And we're also worried that um, their distribution pattern involved replicating all messages to all SignalR nodes. And we were a little worried that this model may not scale up as fully as we'd like if every message always had to be delivered to every server. So having used Redis and being aware of Redis pub sub, we had a look to see if this might be able to be a suitable, a suitable feature to, to fit our needs. So for those of you, if you're not aware of Redis pub sub, it's a great feature. I think it should probably be called Redis Sub Pub because really you want to subscribe before you publish anything, but maybe this is just another like month day thing. Anyway, if you're not familiar, uh, this is just pulled from the uh, Redis commands thing, commands reference online. Um, subscribe, you call subscribe, you pass a channel name. That client is then a subscribing client. Um, just something to watch out for, once you have a Redis client that is in subscribe mode, it can't execute other commands. So if you need to be able to publish or do any of the normal key access stuff you do with a Redis client, you need to create a second Redis connection. And then once you've subscribed to a channel, it's very easy to publish to a channel a particular message. Um, I think it's worth pointing out at this point that there's no queue here, there's no buffer. Like everything else in Redis, it's single-threaded. You publish to a channel. Any clients which are subscribed to that channel, it'll send them the message, 
and then it'll tell you how many clients it attempted to publish to. If there are no subscribers, no one gets the message. So we looked at that and we thought that might fit our needs, and so we built the Roblox real-time message delivery system. So I'll give you a quick run through, through how that works now. User one comes along and wants to have a great time on Roblox. So uh, they could be visiting roblox.com, they could open up the Roblox app on their phone. The first thing it does is it's gonna create a signal R connection, most likely using WebSockets. The web server is then gonna subscribe to Redis. So we decided to go with a user-based channel system. So the server that it connects to will subscribe to the, the channel for that particular user. And then once that's established, it's there ready, waiting to receive messages. User two comes along, and user two is a friend of user one, so he wants to send a message to say hello, um, and he hits you know, one of our chat web servers and says, hey, send a message. The chat web server does whatever it needs to do to update the chat system, and then it publishes to Redis on that user one's channel to say, hey, there's a, topic, there's a message here, it's about chat, there's a new message in conversation one. Redis relays that message to the subscribing web server. The web server pumps that message into the SignalR connection, and SignalR relays it to the client. User one can then hit the chat server to get the new messages. And user one can see that it can get the new messages from the chat server, it can update the UI, the little message ding goes ding, and user one knows immediately that they have a new message from their friend. And at that point, the connection is still open, it's ready to pump down any other messages which might come its way. So in this example, it was chat, but the message publishing logic we're able to bundle up as a standard component which can be included in any of our applications on the server side. So that message could very easily come from our present system when someone's coming online or offline, from a friend system when someone's accepting or declining a friend request, uh, from our notification system to tell you to increment the number of little notifications in the top corner. Any of our systems can publish to this. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about how we, um, a few design decisions we made to try and ensure that this would scale to meet both our needs when we built it, but also be something that would scale up as our user basing um, group. Because as I mentioned, we were experiencing really strong user growth at that time. We also wanted it to be something that we could expand upon and, and add more features, more message publishers as the needs grew. So one of our guiding principles was one user, one connection. At every stage of this pipeline, try and ensure for each user there's only one connection. Now, I mean, that seems like an obvious kind of thing to shoot for, but there's a few little subtleties to it. So at the Redis level, uh, as I mentioned, we have a user-based channel system. And what we do is that we have each user is tied to a specific Redis instance. So we use a consistent hashing mechanism to tie user one to a particular Redis node. So when, it, when the real-time server is subscribing for them, it only needs to subscribe to one Redis node. And anyone who wants to publish to that user only needs to publish to one node. So we can easily scale out our Redis nodes horizontally in line with either uh, Redis subscription density or message throughput, whichever one we hit first. And of course, on the web server level, each user only needs to make one WebSocket connection. So we can scale that out horizontally in terms of new user connections as well. So okay, one user, one connection, that might be a little too ambitious for a couple of reasons. But one device, one connection, surely we can do that. But a few little problems there. So user one, he's back on Roblox, and um, obviously he's not connecting directly with his brain. We're not quite there yet. Um, let's say he, um, he's on a desktop computer, so he opens up a browser, opens up a browser tab and goes to roblox.com. That browser connects to the real-time web server. Okay, great. Of course, if you're on a desktop computer, you're not limited to one tab. You can open up two tabs, you can open up 10 tabs, you can open up 100 tabs. Um, so if all of them connect, then that's starting to blow out our scale a little bit. Um, and even though we, we have a large number of mobile users, our desktop audience is still sizable enough 
that it wouldn't take many users with a large number of tabs to significantly increase the number of WebSocket connections we needed to support. And even early on, it was becoming increasingly clear that that would be one of the areas that we'd need to scale the most. So what we did was, we said, wouldn't it be nice if only one of those tabs had to connect? So we took advantage of that and the, the fact that all of the tabs, if they're on roblox.com, they're sharing the, same, um, sharing the same origin. So we worked out a synchronization method so that one of the tabs would be elected as the lead tab. And then our real-time JavaScript client said, the client is consistent and can relay messages to any parts of the website that's interested in it, any widgets. Uh, but where it, gets, where it sources its message from can change. So for the lead tab, it sources its messages from the real-time web server. For the other tabs, they source their messages from our cross-tab relaying system. And then whenever a message comes in, the lead tab receives it and relays it to the other tabs. There's a few different ways you can achieve this. Uh, at the moment, we're using storage events because that's the most reliable way we've found uh, by pushing it into JavaScript storage. That can raise a storage changed event. The other tabs can listen to it. And we can very efficiently relay those messages to those other tabs. So this way, it really lets us cut down the number of connections we have from desktop users. And it actually provides a better experience for users as well, because once one tab is connected, any subsequent tabs that they open, even as they're navigating around, they don't need to wait for the WebSocket connection to be reestablished when the page loads, because it's already ready to go on the other tab. So it actually speeds up page load a little. Similarly, on our mobile devices, um, as I mentioned, we used a C++ client so that we could have support for our real-time system on all of our devices across all of the platforms that we support. Now, the native application code listens to real-time messages to do stuff with them. Sometimes we also need to show web views within that. So a third way that our JavaScript client can source messages is by listening to the native app itself for messages to be pumped in. So with this, across all of our platforms, any device that we have can make a connection and ideally, it's only one connection. All right. Can't limit it to one per user. Can probably limit it to one per device. But you need to have a little bit of leeway. Um, some users have multiple devices. Sometimes maybe we don't detect that a connection is dropped, and we don't want to prevent them from starting a new connection. So we don't want to limit it to just one, but we do want to limit how many connections a user can make. Um, and this is something that we found. When you're dealing with long-lived connections, um, some of the common strategies you might apply to restricting usage of, say, a very short-lived HTTP request don't quite work as well as you'd expect. So it's very easy to, to limit, say, the number of requests a particular user can make in some period of time. But the thing with a long-lived connection is I could limit you to only making one, one new connection per second but you could create one every second for a minute, and then you'd have 60. You could create one every second for an hour and have thousands. Um, so we really needed to ha have a, another way of controlling this. So we took advantage of the fact that the way SignalR works, it sends a heartbeat message to each of its clients every 10 seconds. So we tapped into that and also updated our own tracking system to track for each user, uh, for each IP address, for some common metrics that we use to control and detect and rate limit activity in our system, and kept an active list of what we believe are the active connections for that user. So that way, whenever a user wants to try and create a new connection, we can consult that list and see, yep, you've only got two, you can create another one, or you're already at your limit, we're going to turn that down. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, there are no queues involved natively in Redis PubSub. And there, isn't any, there aren't any cues in my diagrams because we don't actually have any. Uh, we made the decision up front that this system would be a best effort delivery. We wouldn't guarantee delivery of any messages. Um, it's always you know, an important decision, and there are trade-offs to be made with any system about what level of guarantees you want to provide. Um, and we decided for this it would be best effort. Um, and that's for a, a number of reasons. But, it's key that if a user is not connected to the real-time system when a message is sent, that message will be dropped. Um, and we decided to do this because 
The real-time system is not meant to be a source of truth. It's not part of the chat system, even though the chat system heavily uses it. It's not part of the present system. It's not responsible for telling you what your chat messages are. It's just responsible for telling you that something about the state of the system has changed. So if you miss a message, no data is lost. All is lost, the only thing that is lost is the knowledge that there is a change. And what would it mean to guarantee delivery in this case? We could perhaps guarantee that you know, every message we sent to, we published to a Redis server was delivered to a real-time web server, but we don't necessarily know that the user is still subscribed. Maybe they've navigated away, maybe they've closed the app. Uh, we could wait until it's picked up from the server, but by how many devices? It could be one, the user could be on multiple devices. Now, I mean, there are, there are solutions to all these problems. We could definitely track that. We could have some system where we look at how all these messages are delivered. But we decided to start simple and just say, if a message is missed, it's missed. How long would a stored message be useful anyway? If I send you a message and you don't find out about that till the next time you log into Roblox, which could be the next day, it's kind of lost its value to know that you had two messages and I was typing in one of them a day ago. You log in, your client updates with the latest state of the chat system and displays it to you. The messages have lost their value, so they don't have a huge lot of long-term value. And if you're in an active conversation and someone sends you three messages, if the first one gets lost, well, as long as you get notified about the subsequent ones, the chat system's still gonna update. Now, of course, if I send you a message and you don't get notified about that, maybe I'm not gonna send you anything else because I'm waiting for a reply. So we thought that we do need, or we do want some mechanism to know that a message has been missed. So for this reason, we used a sequence number system. Whenever a user, whenever a message is published to a user, we increment a sequence number for that user. And that gets delivered with the message. And whenever a user connects, we tell them what the current sequence number is. So that way, if they're receiving messages and one is missed, we can, the client is easily able to detect that and let any consumers decide how they do or don't want to try and refresh the data. And whenever they establish a new connection, they can see if any messages have come in since they were last connected. So if it's, they're coming back after a few days away, obviously there's gonna be a lot that they've missed. But uh, if there's just a brief disconnect, say between changing between pages, or if they're on a mobile device, maybe they're switching between cell towers, uh, it means that when the connection is reestablished, if the sequence number hasn't changed, they know they haven't missed anything, and they don't need to refresh anything. They still have the latest state of the system. Uh, if it has changed, then they can update different parts of the system accordingly. So another um, design decision that we consciously took was to only send messages in one direction, uh, which might seem odd because one of the great things about WebSockets is it's meant to be a two-way, you know, continuous connection. That's you know, one of the claims of the signal R library. It facilitates two-way communication. But really, the reason we have this system is it's trying to solve one problem. It's hard for a server to push messages to a client. We already have a great way for clients to request information from the server, normal HTTP requests. And we're gonna to need to continue supporting them on an ongoing basis anyway. The, the purpose of the real-time system is, it's just a general purpose system. It's not part of the chat system, as I mentioned earlier. So we don't want the real-time system, we don't want clients to be asking the real-time system, hey, what's the latest chat message? Hey, which of my friends came online? Because as we add more and more events into it, we don't want it to become a dumping ground for um, requests of any type. Because that would kind of break with our microservices architecture. So whenever a message comes in, the pattern is that it's delivered through the real-time system, and then the client can find out more about that from whichever source system is responsible for that message. Uh, on a related note, we try and limit the breadth of the notifications that we send. Um, so in this example, um, we show that a message has been sent to user one. It tells them, hey, there's a new message. Great, and that gets delivered. But let's assume that it wasn't just a conversation between user one and user two. Let's assume that the conversation was actually between users one, two, and three, who are all friends. What we would actually do is publish one message to user one, 
one to use a two, and one to use a three. You know, I say, well, hey, why are you sending three messages? You know they're all in the same conversation. Why can't you just publish to a conversation channel? Um, and that's because a user could be in lots of conversations. They can be in hundreds. We didn't want each server to have to subscribe to hundreds of topics just to be able to serve any possible request that could come up. Because I could send a message in any conversation at any time. And the other thing is, by narrowing it specifically to a user, we know the behavior of those published requests. Again, because Redis, you know, a single-threaded system, we like knowing the performance characteristics of any operation we perform on it. If we're publishing to a single user, we know there should be, in most cases, zero or one subscribers from the real-time system, and it'll go to one user. If we're publishing to a topic, there could be many subscribers, and we don't know how many there are gonna be when we send that message. As a slight aside, you might also notice here that we're publishing a message to user two, the user who sent the message. Uh, you might be wondering why we bother doing that. I mean, they sent the message, surely they know that it's been sent. Um, again, user two might be on multiple devices. Uh, so this is just a little nicety. It means that even if it's not the device that the users sent the message on, it can still be updated with that new message. So it's, it's often a useful um, approach to, to publish messages even to the user who may have triggered it. So, having put this system into place, how did it all pan out? So the new chat system, which was built and took advantage very strongly of our real-time messaging system, uh, rolled out to a big success. Uh, now, this wasn't too unexpected because really the, the previous system did have some severe deficiencies. We would have been very disappointed if it hadn't performed much better. But uh, we almost immediately saw a huge increase in the number of users who were using the chat system, a three or four time multiple. Um, and that's even excluding, excluding user base growth, just the proportion of our users who were using the chat system regularly. Uh, and we also saw strongly increased messaging rates. The people who were using it were sending a lot more messages. So this makes sense if you can reliably, when you send a message, know that the other person's gonna see it and respond quickly. And just to reinforce the, the importance of real-time information to users, um, as I mentioned, you can use the chat system to see when your friends are playing a game, and if you wanna join them, you can click a button and you'll be pulled into game with them. Um, having since rolled this out, uh, if ever we have a little glitch in our present system and things are a little slow to update, we get lots of support calls saying, hey, I tried to join my friend because it said they were playing game X, but when I got in there, they weren't there. Um, so they really expect that information to be up to date and they rely on that to try and find out what their friends are doing, join them, and have a really social experience. So once they've had that, it's, it's a really core part of the Roblox experience. As for the real-time system itself, we launched this uh, probably about a year and a half ago, and we launched on PC first uh, because we were still waiting on getting, rolling out the, the client to all of our different client platforms. So we launched with about 150,000 concurrent connections at peak. And as I mentioned, user, gro user growth has really taken off at Roblox. And with the, the inclusion of mobile platforms, we now have over a million connections at peak, all connected to the system. We started out with four Redis pub sub servers. Um, and as this user growth has come on, as we brought on more platforms, we now have four Redis pub sub servers still. This actually was not at all the bottleneck of the system. And we, we figured that was gonna be the case when we were testing it. We, you know, we did some load testing and we just found we could just throw huge volumes of subscriptions, huge, huge volumes of messages at it, which was uh, really great to see. And I mean, having used Redis before, we knew that it's a high performance system, but you always gotta take you know, claims with a grain of salt, but it's performed really well. We launched with about 15 web servers to support the WebSocket connection, and we knew early on that this was really gonna be the part that would have to scale quite significantly with user growth. Uh, now we have 27 web servers. Um, so I think that's around 40, 45,000 connections, concurrent connections at peak. Um, by really focusing on um, reducing the number of WebSocket connections we need to support, uh, that really helps us contain the number of web sockets we need to support that system. And at the moment, we're pumping about 20,000 messages per second through the real-time system. 
So that's where we're at. And we've been really happy with it so far, but you know, we think we can probably take this further. Um, as I mentioned, like, we really think that the interactive experience of being able to keep users up to date is really important. So we're going to continue expanding that, pushing more and more events into the system, because we know that the, the message relay part of the system has huge growth to, um, sorry, has huge excess capacity that we can take advantage of. Um, so you might be saying, OK, that's all well and good. But I'm at the Redis Conf. I want to know about Redis. And it turns out that you're telling me that PubSub, that wasn't actually where the bottleneck was. I want to know if it can do more. Can it do more? Well, good question, collective thought of the audience. And <laughs> it's one that at Roblox, someone asked me and the team that had been working on this. See, we were running into a little bit of a problem. We, had a, we have a distributed caching system for our internal services. Um, whenever a... Whenever a record from one of the hundreds of different entities we have is looked up from data stores, whether that be some type of SQL data store or other stores, we have a standard caching library which um, may populate that into a shared cache as well as, crucially, into a local cache on every machine. So this is great, and over the long history of Roblox, um, all of our services have been built on the built taking advantage of the particular performance characteristics of this caching system. And the way it worked is that every time a, an, an entity was updated, the server that updated it would have to send out an invalidation message to all the other servers to let them know to evict it from their cache. And the way this worked uh, is we were sending out a broadcast, a uh, multicast message across the network. But we were reaching a problem where this was reaching a saturation point. And uh, the the volume of network traffic was sufficient that it was raising to such a level that even minor blips, minor uh, disruptions, could trigger a whole bunch of retry mechanisms causing more traffic, causing more problems, and leading to some cascading failures. Now, we have some plans to fundamentally change how we do perform caching at Roblox anyway. But that's a longer term plan because, as I mentioned, all of our existing services have been built with assumptions based on the current model. So we didn't want to change the performance characteristics of our current caching system, but we really had a problem with our invalidations. Could Redis PubSub possibly come to the rescue? So applying the lessons that we'd learned from the real-time project, we were able to um, it's just that, you know, we think this actually could be a viable solution. Um, taking advantage of the lessons we learned in testing and testing the throughput and the scale of this, we were able to say that this might be, we might be able to use Redis PubSub to distribute cache and validation messages. And developed a plan where we could do this and switch over an entity at a time to replace this system. So how did this pan out? We launched, we now have 24 Redis Pub Sub servers dedicated to cache and validation messages. And this needs to serve over 1,000 application servers, uh, whether that be web servers, API servers, internal background processing servers, anything that's using our entity layer. And the way it works is that servers subscribe to a topic per entity um, on all of the Pub Sub servers as that's needed. So the first time they try and access a entity of a particular type, they subscribe to that channel. And then whenever they update an entity, they publish that to all subscribers of that entity. So this is, the subscribers subscribe to all, mes to all nodes. The publishers just publish to one. And then if there are any failures, they can retry it by publishing to another server, knowing that uh, one of them will get through. So this allows us to still have <coughs> a fair amount of horizontal scaling. So this has been a big success, and it has now completely replaced our previous cache and validation system, and is currently pumping through 35 million messages per second uh, at peak times. So it's, it's very fair to say that Redis PubSub has become a very core cool part of how Roblox keeps our users up to date both directly through our real-time system to our clients at the 
very edges, as well as keeping our core sys server system up to date with the latest entity values. So I hope this has been useful. Maybe you've learned something. It's, um, we've worked hard to achieve a lot of scale there. Uh, but we also achieve a lot of scale with great engineering work. And uh, it's not just me who's been working on this. There's been great work by other Roblox engineers. And um, spinning up new servers is easy, but spinning up new engineers is harder. Uh, but we are hiring. So if you're interested in hearing more about Roblox, I'd be happy to chat. But otherwise, if you have any other questions about Redis PubSub, either ask them now or happy to come chat with you later. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have a question about the, what's a data store? Sorry, I know you can't see me. Uh, what's a data store that actually powers the actual chat messages? So where are they stored? Is that a SQL Server? Is that Redis itself? Uh, yeah, so um, it's also stored in, in Redis. Um, we initially launched only storing it in Redis um, using some of the advanced data structures, um, sorted sets extensively to store lists of conversations and the messages in those conversations. And then we back it with, we're essentially using that as a smart cache at the moment, and then we back it with persistent storage, um, partly in SQL Server for just the metadata about the conversations, but the actual message data we're pumping to DynamoDB in AWS. Uh, so what system you are using to generate a sequence number, and how do you make sure that this is always incrementing? Uh, so once again, uh, Redis to the rescue. Uh, it's actually just a um, string value in a Redis cluster for each user. Uh, again, taking advantage of the fact that um, Redis is single-threaded to perform a um, string increment command. I can't remember the precise name of that Redis command, but we do a string increment command on that uh, Redis entry. And then that can be looked up by the real-time servers whenever a client uh, requests that information on a connect. Um, I have a question like regarding your real-time web server. Which web server are you using for that? So um, our backend server technologies is all .NET. So um, our web server is uh, ASP.NET. Um, we use a mix of MVC and Web API depending on the exact purposes. I think that one's a, that's a Web API server uh, hosted on IIS. And then uh, since you mentioned you handle like 40,000 connections each for, per server, so what kind of hardware specs? Are um, the exact specs of the web server, I, th I think it's just a fairly beefy, but just a fairly standard sort of commodity web server. I think it's probably 16 cores, um, you know, a decent amount of memory. Uh, we sort of found to maintain the, the connections, sort of memory was one of the, the limiting factors. Um, but also just connection stability. Uh, if we found, we, we could add more connections to a server, but if we encountered problems, um, if they all got dropped and had to reconnect, then that added a big uh, load of rushes coming back. So we, you wanna be careful about how many connections you try and cram onto one, one server. I, uh, I was just wondering, how do you uh, handle a failure at the Redis level? Like if you lose one of those Redis boxes, how do you handle the failure of that? So, um, we have some uh, monitoring on that, so we try and detect when a node fails and um, pull it out of the uh, cluster, so to speak. It's not a, a formal cluster, it's just a collection. So we can pull that out. Um, the uh, publishers and subscribers will sync within about 10 seconds. So the consistent hashing will move the user to a new node. It'll start publishing there. There is the possibility that for a few seconds there may be some loss of messages as the publishers and subscribers are out of sync. But we listen to the change, so the subscribers all update. And any connections they had on that server, they, they subscribe on their new locations. Uh, I like your uh, usage of uh, PubSub for the cache invalidation. Uh, we're doing something similar to that. And one of our concerns uh, that we had was a, a case of like a temporary, literally, network cable gets pulled for three seconds and then plugged back in, and someone misses a cache, inv cache invalidation message. How do you handle that? Uh, so we have um, some uh, sort of failure detection stuff. If we detect that a connection, for an individual server, if we detect that a connection is lost, we can, we can purge the local cache at that point. Um, we know there probably are some circumstances where there's a little bit, maybe a message get missed, gets missed on the way out. If um, you know, it performs the update and then the connection comes out before it can send the invalidation. Um, 
check the sequencing on that. I don't know all the nitty gritty details of that one. I didn't work on that specifically. We, th we think that there may be some edge cases for that, um, but we, we think we're getting a higher um, successful invalidation rate than we were with our previous approach. And, and we, we're sort of aware that there's the possibility this could happen. For really critical entities where you really want to have the latest information, then we, we have approaches in place to, to ensure that uh, out, outside of this uh, general sort of caching layer to, to make sure we're dealing with the latest data. You said you had a collection of uh, Redis servers. Did you try it with Cluster and then run away after the SignalR driver? <laughs> um, or not even try it? We, uh, we didn't try in that case. Yeah. Uh, so when you have your uh, nodes connected, like users connected to a node, um, and they're subscribing for real-time messages on Redis, when they disconnect, do you stop publishing also, or do you still keep publishing, or how do you keep track of that? Uh, we actually, we always publish. Uh, you know, we, we could have looked at trying to detect if a user's connected or, or check the present system, but we didn't sort of want to introduce additional dependencies in it, and it's, it's such a lightweight call to Redis to just call publish. Uh, if no one's subscribed, then it has to do very little work in return, so we, we don't even bother checking. We just, whenever there's a message for a user, we just publish it. If someone's there, great. If not, oh well. Uh, in this case, it's a particular instance of Redis on a on a physical server. Hydration concerns of, of data on server startup or whatever. Uh, we, we don't need to sort of hydrate any any data there. Um, are you talking about in terms of in the the system itself? Or? Yeah, like for example, um, the the messages that are being sent out to the users, mm -hmm. right? So, um, if one of the instances was to fail over and restart or whatever, it needs to have some of those messages in there as well, or are they just lost? Uh, they're potentially just <coughs> lost, um, and it's it's up to the. Um, the publishing service, if, if we want to have a service where we have some retry mechanism, um, we, we could potentially build that. Um, particularly in if we have background processes doing work, then it could be fine to say, well, this, this message didn't finish fully, let's give it another go later. But um, because these messages are delivered to clients, uh, if they're on a desktop, they could be navigating from page to page. They're disconnecting and reconnecting frequently. Um, so we don't sort of expect 100% delivery there. The idea is that if a client's out of date, it can go to the source system. If it's chat, say, hey, give me the latest messages in this conversation. If it's uh, you know, presence, just give me an updated list of which of my friends are online, that kind of thing. Do you think uh, ready stream will change any of this work you did already? Uh, what was that, sorry? Uh, do you think like a ready stream, which is coming with 4.0, will be changing any of the work which you already did? Kind of like a token and streaming and everything? Um, the, the first I sort of learned of the streaming stuff was in this morning's talk, um, so I, I'm not sure how we're going to apply it yet, but it definitely sounds very interesting. I think that's going to be one of the features that I'm really looking into uh, when, when that comes out, yeah. Okay. Thank you.